Hello, I'm Luis Anthony Ast, the Video Math Tutor, and welcome to Basic Math Lesson Number Three: Operations on Numbers. Before we get started, take a moment to go to the CD-ROM here and print up the actual notes for this lesson, and take a moment to go through it before actually watching the video. That's important. Another thing I recommend you do is if you go to the tutoring print shop, which is available on my website or on the actual disc, is this thing. This is uh, student number lines number two. And this will help you as a guide when we're adding, subtracting positive and negative numbers. All right, so I recommend this. Small disclaimer also I want to do. This lesson is designed for students who have already had some knowledge on adding, subtracting, multiplications, and divisions, and powers. Okay, it is not meant for students in grade school who are just learning how to add and subtract, multiply and divide for the very first time. So if you're in that level, this lesson will not help you. What I hope to do today is to enhance your knowledge by introducing the concepts of positive and negative numbers and how to operate with those numbers. Mm -hmm. So let's now take a moment to get started. In this first example, I would like to introduce you the concept of absolute value. What is that? Well, let's say I'd like to find the distance between 0 and 3 on a number line. Okay, I want to find this distance right here. You might know, say, well, that's pretty easy. It's, it's 3. <laughs> And you're right, it's just one unit plus another plus another. It's three units away from zero. Now the notation we're going to use for absolute value are these vertical bars. So the absolute value of three is three. And again, what does that mean? It means what is the distance between zero and the number I'm interested in, three. One, two, three. Yep, that's what it is. That's really all what absolute value is all about. Now you may be wondering, well, what about negative three? What is its absolute value? Well, our concept of absolute value means what is its distance, a number's distance from zero? Well, it's one, two, three units away from zero also, just like three. So let's formalize that. The absolute value of negative three is 3. Now let's look at both of them at the same time. The absolute value of negative 3, we said before, is 3. Why? Because it is 3 units away from 0. Absolute value of 3 is also 3. No big surprise because it is 3 units away from 0. What is the absolute value of 4? Good question. I want you to try first. What do you think? Pretty easy, huh? Absolute value 4 means the distance 4 is away from 0. It is 1, 2, 3, 4 units away from 0. So that is our answer. 4. So absolute values are pretty easy to do. Now, there is one situation that might be a little tricky, so let's try that next. We've always talked about the distance between a number and 0, haven't we? Well, what about zero itself? Hmm, what is its absolute value? That's, that's an interesting question. Hint, 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 nudge, nudge on a test. You know, that's a very typical test question. Well, I've been saying the absolute value is the distance a number is away from zero. So zero is how far away from zero? It, 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 it it's, doesn't have a distance away from zero. Zero is zero away from itself. So that is our answer. And of course, happy face is optional. Okay, you don't have to put it. No, just kidding. Yeah. The answer is zero. Now that we've covered a few examples of absolute value, let's actually look at the formal mathematical definition of absolute value. For any value, any number, the absolute value 
is x if x is greater or equal to zero. Hmm? What in the world? This looks pretty nasty, doesn't it? Well, what that means is that if this x is someplace equal to zero or in the positive direction, its absolute value is just itself. And we saw that with three. If this had been a three, absolute value of three is three. We saw it with four. Absolute value of four is four. It's on the positive side. But now what about the other part right here? You might see this negative, you can go, wait a minute, Mr. Math Tutor, you said absolute values are positive. Negative three, it's absolute value was positive three, so why am I getting this negative? Well, again, this is more of a technicality. What this says is that if x is now in the negative area over here, its absolute value is positive. But since the value of x itself is negative, to change a negative value into a positive, you put a negative in front of it. And that's something we're going to be seeing just after this example. All right? So if the seal seems a little confusing. It's going to be clarified in seconds. So I just want to repeat myself over here. If you have an x that's negative, its answer, you say negative x because if it's negative, a negative in front of it makes it positive. I know it sounds kind of weird, but bear with me on this. But again, this only works if my x's are less than zero. Again, let's actually throw in another value. Let's say I have something like absolute value of negative five. Since this is the x and it's less than zero, its answer is negative x, but x is negative five. A negative with another negative there's a rule for that, and again, we'll be going through more of those details in a little while. The answer is positive. So this is actually equal to positive five, as it should. And again, if you still have a hard time seeing this, again, visualize the number line. And absolute means distances away from zero. So if you have a negative five over here, its distance is five, five units away from zero. And that's a great way to think about how it's got, okay? Absolute value in most graphing calculus look like this. And you place the value within the parentheses. Now there are a couple of ways of finding the absolute value of a number using the calculator. Let's find the absolute value of negative two. Here's what you have to do. First way, of course, turn the calculator on if it was off, press the clear key, and then press the second, and then catalog. It's located right here. Press enter. Now input the negative two. Again, make sure you press the negation key, not the subtraction key. Negative two, close parentheses, and enter. There it is, two. Now another way of doing this problem is, let's just clear this, press the math key, then the right arrow key, see, there's absolute value highlighted right there. Press enter, type in negative two, close parentheses, and enter again. And there you see the two pops up again. So it's pretty easy to do absolute values on the calculator. You have to just find absolute value function. Opposite numbers are the same distance away from zero, but they are located on opposite sides of the number line. So three is the opposite of negative three, and well, negative three is the opposite of three. Now opposite numbers have the same absolute value, and again, we saw that with the three in our earlier examples. That's a good thing to know. And that's really all there is to know about opposite numbers. In this example, let's do some quick drills on finding the opposite of a number. So what do you think the opposite of two is? That's easy, right? It's just negative two. How about the opposite of negative five? Again, negative five is over here. Its opposite would end up on the positive side. So it's just five. 
How about pi? Ooh, that's a weird number. What's the opposite of pi? No, it's not cake. And then the number pi. It would be negative pi. Because positive pi is on the positive side of zero and then it's opposite of the negative side. What's the opposite of zero? Is it negative zero? No. Zero, again, there is no distance away from itself, so its opposite is just itself, zero. That's a little bit tricky. I hope you got it. I want you to be aware of something. This is important. A negative in front of a variable or another number or a grouping symbol means the opposite. So this means the opposite of x. And something like this, negative, negative 8, really you should not say neg negative. You would recite this as the opposite of negative 8. But again, if you want to be fast and say negative 8, that's okay. But officially, opposite of negative 8, and the answer to that would be what? Yes, 8. The negation key, which is found here, is used to find the opposite of a number of an expression. So it is used to represent both a negative number and a negation, or the opposite, of a number. So a quick example. Find the opposite of negative 2. Now there's a couple ways of doing this. Again, clear the display, type in the negation key, and then negation again, and the number 2, and enter. And the answer is 2. Or for clarity, you really should surround your negative number with a set of parentheses. So let's try this again. Clear, negation, parentheses, and then type in negative 2. And then again, the negative is the negation key again. Close parentheses and enter. The answer is 2. And it's very important you realize that you need to use the negation key, not the subtraction key. All right? when you want to find the opposite of an expression. Addition is the operation of combining numbers to provide an equivalent single value. Now the numbers being added are called the sumands, and the result is called the sum. Now, here's a way to visualize addition. I have a group of little dots here and another group here, and I don't want to combine them into a single group. So I have three dots plus two dots. I have a total of five dots, right? That's pretty straightforward. Using numbers, we're going to get three dots plus, I'm going to combine this with a group of two dots, and that's going to equal a value of five. Now, you know this. Now we're going to change our perspective a little bit, and we'll be using a number line to represent the same type of operation. But we're going to throw in negative numbers now. So that makes it interesting. In this example, we're going to do the operation we just did, but on the number line. All additions start off at zero. That's good to know. And the first part of our sum is I'm going to start off with two. So I want to go from zero to two. So think of it as a jump of length two. All right. And then it says plus 3, so I want to go another jump of a distance of 3. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, so it's going to be something that looks like that. And what value is that? Well, that's going to be 5. So this is a very good way of visualizing additions. Starting off at 0, if the number is positive, you go to the right, you go 2. And then 
I'm going to add 3 to this value, so, and 3 is positive, so you continue going to the right, and it lands on 5. That's our sum. For example, 7, I would like to add up these two numbers. See, now we're to throw in a negative. See what happens. I want to figure out what's negative 3 plus 4. What's that going to equal? Well, the rule is we start off at 0, and we're going to jump to negative 3, and negative 3 is to the left, so we're going to jump this way. All right? And then what, what do we do next? Well, plus 4. 4 is a positive number, so from this negative 3, we're going to make a jump of a distance of 4. So it's going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, right here. So I'm going to jump back to this value. And what number is that? Well, that's the number 1. So, aha! So that is our answer. Ta da! 1. That's pretty easy. So whenever you're dealing with additions of negatives or positives, try to mentally picture a number line. Or, again, use that student number line's number 2 sheet. That's what it's for. And draw these pictures. Let's take a moment now to look at the official rules of adding numbers. And we'll use this as a guide. Here's our number line. Positive numbers means you go to the right. Negative numbers mean you go to the left. That's what this means. And what if you want to add a positive number plus another positive number? What is the result going to be? It's going to be positive. In fact, that's just a regular addition you learned since grade school, right? Because a positive number means you can go to the right, and when you do another jump in the positive direction, you're still in the positive area. You go over here. That's pretty straightforward. Now, the next rule is what if you start off with a negative? So we go in this area. Mm -hmm. And you're going to add another negative to this value. What's the final answer going to be? Well, let's look, take a look over here. I start at 0, and you start off and make a jump in a negative direction, and then you make another jump in a negative direction. Where do you land? In a negative area, right? So a negative plus a negative is still negative, much like my bank account. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I'll be okay. So in a nutshell, if the numbers have like signs, the result, the sum, has the same sign as the numbers you started with. If it's a positive and a positive, the answer is positive. If it's negative and negative, the answer is negative. Very straightforward. We have a situation where we have different signs. A positive plus a negative is a what? Or maybe it starts with a negative and it's positive. What's that going to give us? Hmm. Well, previously we saw if we have a negative 3 plus 4, the answer was 1. Okay, so you're starting at 0, you jump to negative 3, and then you go a distance of 4, and it lands at 1. We know this. How can we get the 1 and make sure it's a positive one, not a negative one? Super easy rule. Ignore the signs, so pretend that's just a 3, and subtract bigger number minus smaller number. Okay, so I'm going to say 4 minus 3. Well, 4 minus 3 is 1. And then here's the deal. The sign that goes at the end matches the sign of whichever one of these numbers is larger without counting the sign. Okay? Officially, what you're doing is you subtract the numbers and put the sign of the one that has a larger absolute value. Okay, so the absolute value of negative 3 is 3, the absolute value of 4 is 4, 4 minus 3 is 1, 4 has a large absolute value, it was positive, the answer is 1. 
Again, that's a lot of math right there, but again, if you just keep in mind, I'm just going to subtract by two numbers, ignoring the signs, bigger minus smaller, and whichever one was bigger, that's the sign I put. Now, when you say bigger and smaller, yes, negative numbers are always smaller than positive, but I mean, without looking at the negative, four is bigger than three. Four is positive, so that's the sign, positive. Let's look at a, a different example. How about switching the signs? So, positive three plus a negative four would be what? Well, looking at our number line, we're actually going to be starting at, let's actually change color and start at three. So, zero, one, two, three is over here. So, you're going to jump to three. I'm going to add to it a negative four. And again, the negatives means we go to the negative direction. Okay? So, I'm going to go, this is the one, two, three, four. So, it's going to jump all the way over here. That value is negative one. Now, again, that's using the number line. Here's our negative one. But now let's use our rule. I'm going, ignoring the signs, four minus three, because four is bigger than three, is one, but four was the bigger number. It has a negative in front of it, so aha, that's the sign I put there, negative. Rule number four. What if we're given the situation we have any number plus, so what does this represent? The opposite of the number. So we learned about that earlier. What would its sum be? Hmm. So here's an example. How about two? It means I take two steps. Plus its opposite. Now what is the opposite? Opposite means again the other side, the opposite side of the, of the number line. So the positive two is one, negative two would be the other. So I'm going to now move in the negative direction. Where do I end up? Right back where I started, right? So that's essentially the rule. If you go a certain number of units and then you do the opposite of that, well, you end up landing on zero. And that works with negatives. So let's say I'm, I'm starting on zero and I have to go, let's say negative three. So I go one, two, three in the negative area. And I want to add its opposite. So even though it has a negative in front of it, the opposite of a negative is a positive. So I go one, two, three. Deja vu. I feel like I've just been here. Well, I have. Back where I started. Zero. Rule number five. For our last rule, we have zero and we're going to add any number to it. What's the result going to be? So you're starting at zero and let's say x is positive, so you're going to go in the positive direction and that's all you're going to move is x number of steps. That's where you stop. So the answer is, well, x. And x could have been negative, so if you start with zero and you go to negative area, that's your answer, right where I start with the negative. So, to, so it works regardless if x is positive or negative. So zero plus a number is just the number itself. And, little side note here, it would work if we switch these around. The same thing. If you go a certain number of x units in one direction or the other, plus zero, which means don't add anything else, you stop after the certain number of steps you started with. On page nine of your notes, there's an example eight that has a very detailed list of sums that I ask you to do. They're right here. Now, in the notes I ask you to do this by hand and then also on the calculator. I won't go through the calculator steps in the video. They're pretty much laid out here on the paper, so just look at this for the calculator keystrokes. But let's take a moment now to look at these problems. And let's use our five rules to help us get the answer. Okay? Eight plus five, positive, and the positive, the answer is positive. And eight plus five, as we know, again, if you have to use fingers and toes, go right ahead, the answer is 13. Here's another example of rule number two. 
a negative number plus a negative. And again, I put in parentheses for clarity. I don't like having the pluses and the minuses right next to each other. It just, just, just doesn't look right. Okay. So let's just get rid of that. So negative 8 plus a negative 10. A negative plus a negative is a negative. So negative 8 and negative 10 is going to be negative 18 because you're staying in a negative area. Remember that. What's so the ne next problem here? Negative 12 plus 6. Hmm, see these are the, the nasty ones. We've got different signs. Well, what's the rule? Ignoring the sign, the negative sign, just go bigger number minus smaller. 12 minus 6 is 6. Now, what's the sign, plus or minus? Well, 12 is bigger than 6. So there's a negative in front of it, so aha, uh -huh, that's the answer, negative six. Here's another example of big signs, five plus a negative four. Ignoring the negative, get rid of that, temporarily, go five minus four is one. Five is bigger than four, and five is positive, so this must be also positive, so aha. Uh -huh. Now, there's no need to go plus one like that. Okay, it's implied. So just leave the, neg the negatives you leave, positives you don't. Now, one of the examples is stated in this form. The sum of nine and its opposite. So they give you a, almost like a word problem. Well, the sum of means we're adding things up. 9 and its opposite. Well, 9, so that means I want to add 9 plus its opposite, which is negative 9. See, oh, did you catch that? Let's make that negative with parentheses around it. What is the answer? Take 9 steps and then 9 steps back. The answer is 0. And finally, 0 plus 7 is, that's right, 7. Subtraction is the inverse or the reverse operation of addition. With addition, you add numbers together, while with subtraction, you take away numbers. The number that is taken away from the original numbers called the subtrahend. The original numbers called the minuend and the result of subtraction is called the difference. When we're adding stuff together, we're doing several groups and combines into one. With subtraction, you're starting off with one group, and I want to remove, I want to take away a couple, let's say, items, and, we'll, and find out, well, what are you left with? That's really what all subtraction is all about. Symbolically, we're asking, well, if you have five items to start with, and you subtract or take away, that's the symbol for that, of course we all know that, take away two items, the result is equal to, the answer is three. We have three items left. And that is what subtraction is all about. The rule for subtraction is, change the second term, the subtrahend, to its opposite, and then add the terms together. You might think, well, why? I could just subtract these things. The answer is seven. That's easy. We learned it from grade school. Well, when things get more complicated, you throw in some algebra, or some rather complicated formulas, adding things together is way easier than subtracting. So let's apply the rule to this. So I'm going to write down 10. And instead of minus, I'm going to say plus the opposite of 3, which is negative 3. And then you can visualize the number line or just try to think about it. And the answer is, of course, 7. Let's try another example. Subtract negative 5 from 8. So whenever you see something like subtract something from something, this is actually the second part of the subtraction. So let's write down the 8 first. So it's going to be 8 
minus, and then a negative 5. Let's now use our rule. So this is actually equal to 8 plus the opposite of negative 5 is 5. And see, this is way easier to do than this, right? So the answer is 13. To subtract using the calculator, use the subtraction key right here. Okay? Don't mix that key with the negation. Let's do an example. I want you to find negative 11 minus a negative 6. On the calculator, you would just first press the clear key, of course. Type in a negative 11, go negation or, or negate 11. Press the subtraction key, parentheses, negative 6, close parentheses, and enter. The answer is negative 5. Now I want you to know something very careful on the display screen. Look at the minus sign and the negative sign. They're, they're a little bit different sizes and one is just like one pixel higher than the other. Why, why is that done? Well, it's just so you can differentiate between the two on the, on the display. Now here's a hot tip. When writing negative numbers by hand, for example, negative 5, make your negative a little bit longer than you may normally have done in the past. Why? Well, for emphasis, so this, you can say negative 5. I've seen this quite a bit with students. They write their 5 and a negative, and they just put a little, little smudge right there. And maybe when a teacher and his math instructor is grading a test or homework assignments, that almost looks like a 0.5. Uh, another example is the 5, and they put the negative right there, it's, it's almost like connected here. So it's almost like lost altogether. So I really recommend make it a habit that when you make your negative, make them a little bit longer than normal. Okay, okay, don't get obnoxious. Yeah, negative 5! <laughs> Keep it straightforward, okay? Come on. What if we're given a situation where we have a negative 3 and a 4, and I'd like to find the distance between these two numbers? How can I go about doing that? Hmm. Well, maybe I can just, you know, just measure the distance, right? I can just, uh, I can just maybe, um, well, I don't think it's going to work. Um, the scale here is different. So this is not going to help. It's got to be another way. Well, I can maybe just count. Since I already have a scale, I have tick marks on it. I'll just count the tick marks I have you know, starting over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hmm. The answer is seven. Yeah, but I started over here. What if I had started on this side? All right, let's try that. So, over here, I'm four. I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, it's still seven. The next thing I want to do is figure out, well, what will be a systematic way for any numbers? I mean, negative three and four is not so bad, but what if we had larger numbers or decimals or variables? A's and B's, X's and Y's. What would be a formula that would represent distance? And when we talked about distance, what was I referring to? Absolute value, right? Absolute value of 4 was its distance from 0. The absolute value of negative 3 is its distance from 0. So maybe I can relate absolute value with the distance between, not just from zero, but any two numbers. So let's try something. How about uh, the absolute value, and how about negative three, and there's a four, and I want the answer to be seven. Now, I don't know what's in the middle yet. 
I know the distance is 7 because I just counted the units for this. What if we add it? Negative 3 plus 4. Is that 7? Well, no. Negative 3 plus 4 is 1, and the absolute value of 1 is 1. So that doesn't give us 7. So adding doesn't seem to help. Well, how about subtracting? What if I went, oh, negative 3 minus 4? Well, what is negative 3 minus 4? Negative 3, using our rules that we just learned, minus, make it a plus, and change the sign of 4, gives us a negative 3 plus a negative 4 is a negative 7. But this number is now inside the absolute value. So we'll put absolute value around that. And absolute value of negative 7, we learned also earlier, is 7. Ah, which is what we wanted. Hmm. But will that work for anything? And again, that's writing down negative 3 first and then the 4. What if I had the other way around? So let's try that next. Okay, here I switched the numbers around. I put 4 first and then negative 3, and there's my subtraction. Again, I know my answer is 7. I want to get that officially. So to subtract these two numbers, we learned earlier again, we change the sign of the second term and put its opposites, change its sign. So it'll be 4 plus opposite of negative 3 is positive 3. And that 7, again, officially this is the inside of the absolute value, so this is still inside absolute value. But we know that the absolute value of 7 is 7. So our little experiment of subtracting the, these two values, regardless of which one's listed first and which one's listed second, gives us the right answer. And with that in mind, let's now state the official rule. Now in this case, we're giving just two arbitrary numbers. I don't know what they are. I don't know where they are in relation to 0. Just two points on number 1. I want to find their distance. The formula for that, using the information we did previously, is that you subtract the two values. And you take the absolute value, and that's going to be the distance. And again, it doesn't matter if it's a minus b or b minus a, because when you take the absolute value of something, the end result is always positive. Well, except for zero itself, but you know what I mean. Now, traditionally, in most textbooks, or maybe in class, you may see this formula. The second one, b minus a. It doesn't really matter. Whichever one you want to use. And that's the formula for distance. And we'll use some, do some examples of this in the lesson quiz. Multiplication is a shorthand notation for repeated addition or subtraction. To illustrate this repeated addition or subtraction, let's look at this scenario. I'm repeating the same addition. 6 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6. Oh, sorry. The answer, of course, is 24. Well, this isn't too bad to write out, but what if we had 10 of these or 20 of these sixes in a row? That's a lot of writing. So they've come up with a shorthand notation. It's called multiplication. So how many sixes do we have here? Well, it repeats itself four times. Ah, so we can say it's four. And the way we represent four times something, we use the multiplication sign, which we also can say times. Four times what? Six is equal to, well, it's the same value, 24. OK? That's all that multiplication is about. It's a way of compacting repeated numbers that are being added together, or subtracted for that matter. There's actually several ways of representing multiplication, timesing stuff. We saw one of them, just the multiplication sign, 4 times 6. That's fine with numbers, but when you venture into algebra and you're dealing with variables, that time sign looks a lot like an X, doesn't it? It's a little smaller, but it can get confusing. So 
if it's just numbers, yes, the time sign is fine. Life is good. Variables or a mixture of numbers and variables like this, time sign is not a good thing. Well, what can we do? Well, there are several options. The first one is the raised dot. I can just put a dot right there, and that represents multiplication. Now, the raised dot for numbers, see, that doesn't look too good because that almost looks like 4.6, a decimal. So, if you just want to write a very quick multiplication on paper with variable dot, that's fine. But let's not use the dot too much. I will. So will you. Not too much. What other options are there? Well, my favorite, parentheses. Let's just put some parentheses on this thing. I can surround the first one or the second one with parentheses. It doesn't matter. Or both, for that matter. And the rule is, if you have something on the outside of parentheses, and there's absolutely nothing right there between the variable and the parentheses, it's called implied multiplication. Okay? It's, it's presumed that these two numbers or variables are being multiplied together. Okay? And again, I can place these variables in such a way that the parentheses are on the x. Or you can just put parentheses around both. Again, see there's nothing right there in between the two sets of parentheses, so that means multiplication. I personally like this method the best. Now, you don't have to, again, write two sets of parentheses. One set is fine. And it's a very powerful type of notation because you can have very complicated expressions. As long as you put parentheses around them, you use multiplication. Now, using the parentheses, it's pretty handy also if instead of just having numbers with numbers and variables with variables, let's say you had a number with the variable, again, very clear that they multiply together. Now, yes, I can put the parentheses around the four, but traditionally, that's not done. If there's a number to the left of a variable, and by the way, number should be to the left of a variable, traditionally, the parentheses should go around the variable. Okay? Now, there's actually one more notation that's even better. It's more compact than parentheses. Again, parentheses are great because when you have several things together, it groups them all one big bunch. The best notation that represents multiplication is called implied multiplication. Just put the variables together or the numbers and variables together. So when you have a 4x like this, this really represents 4 times x. If you have just variables, x and y, this represents x times y. Again, there's nothing between the two variables so that it's implied to be multiplied together. Now, there's nothing special about parentheses. Any type of symbols that can group or encompass items together can serve to represent multiplication. For example, I can have parentheses with the x times y, but see, I can also use what I call square brackets or just brackets for short. Again, as long as there's nothing between the two, this is implied multiplication. And hey, why stop there? We can also do something like with curl braces, or curly braces, or just braces for short. Now, I don't recommend this last one very much, because later on in other math topics, this might represent something else. The numbers or variables being multiplied together are called the factors. The result of a multiplication is called the product.
We learned earlier how to add numbers with like signs and different signs. There are similar rules for multiplications. If the signs are the same, either positive times a positive or negative times a negative, it's actually the same rule. It's kind of neat. Positive times a positive is a positive number. And likewise, a negative times a negative, I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's true. The answer is positive also. Now, what's the rule if the signs are different? Positive times a negative is going to be a negative. And if it starts negative and you're going to multiply by a positive number, well, the answer is also going to be negative. To sum up the first two rules is if you're given two, only two factors, if they have the same sign, the answer is positive. If they're different signs, the product is negative. For our next rule, if you have zero times any number, again, I change the symbols to parentheses because I don't want to use a time sign. What's the result? Well, the rule is zero times any number is zero. And we can actually switch this around. You can have zero in the inside of parentheses or on the right hand side. So any number times zero is still zero. Now this is a very important rule and it's actually called the zero factor property of numbers. And we'll definitely be doing more of this as you do other lessons. Now here's a special warning. Don't confuse the rules for addition and multiplication. Something like negative 5 plus a negative 2, the signs are the same, but the answer is negative 7. With multiplications, negative 5 times a negative 2, the rule is like signs, the answer is positive, it's positive 10. The rules for zeros is if it's a zero plus a number, it's just the number itself when you're adding. But with multiplication, we just saw the zero factor property, zero times a number is always zero, no matter what. When multiplying by negative one, there's a number of different ways you can write down the two products of a negative one times you know, some variable, some number. And here's a list of possible ways of doing this. You can have the variable times negative one, both in parentheses, which is not the norm because you like to have numbers first, so you can switch it around. You can not use parentheses, just say negative one and then times x, is again, it's implied multiplication. You can put the parentheses with the negative one and not with the x, that's fine too. Again, that also means multiplication. You can just avoid parentheses altogether and just say negative one and then again, there's nothing between the one and the x, so it's implied multiplication. So that's another way of writing down the answer. You don't have to even write the one. Just say negative times x. And to go a step further, we can simplify it to this final answer, just negative x, or the opposite of x, which is of course the more proper way, but you can just say negative x. And this really means negative one times x. So there's quite a few ways of writing down the answer. Now when you're doing different math problems and you want to get a final answer, try to make it look like this last one because that's the, the simplest of all these. The times key seen here is used to represent multiplication. To differentiate from the letter x, the calculator actually displays the multiplication using an asterisk like this. Here's an example. What is negative 13 times 27. To input this in the calculator, all you need to do is, of course, clear the display, type in the negative, then 13 times 27, and of course, enter. The answer is negative 351. Now, the calculator understands implied multiplication. So, if you don't want to type in the times key, you can just use parentheses. You can encompass the first term or the second term or both using parentheses, and it understands what you're doing. Slight warning here. On paper, it's okay to use a raised dot, but on the calculator, 
The only dot you see on here is a decimal point, which cannot be used as a multiplication symbol. Only use the times key, seen here, to represent multiplication. If you don't want to use the times key, again, like I said before, you can use the parentheses as grouping symbols for implied multiplication. One final warning about using the calculator is that you should only use parentheses for grouping. So something like this, three times the quantity, and say they use brackets here. If you want to input this expression in the calculator, well, you should not use the square brackets. The calculator has them, but it's used for something different. So you should use an extra set of parentheses in place of the brackets. And if you have other grouping symbols, like the braces, again, just use extra parentheses. Just as multiplication is an abbreviated form of multiple addition, exponents is a way of abbreviating multiple multiplications. Here's an illustration of this. If you have six times six times six, see, six is repeating itself a multiple number of times. The answer is 216, but there's a way of compacting this. And the way you do that is with exponents. If you have 6 and you say it's being raised to the third power. So you write a, a large 6 and the upper right corner you write a smaller number that matches the number of repeated factors. Or numbers of times each other. That's what exponents are all about. And of course the answer is 216. Let's try a little algebra. What if you have something, let's say, oh, x times, I'll use a raised dot, times x, times x, times x, times, well, I'm going to have a whole bunch of them, n number of x's. So I have, I don't know how many I have, so I'll call it n. What's a compact way of representing all these multiplications? Well, you would say x and is raised to the nth power. That's how you would say that. Or you could say it's x to the nth. That's a more compact way of saying that. By the way, something that's written out with lots of multiplications is called an expanded form. Expanded. Whereas this is called exponent form, exponential notation. It could be called maybe a combination of those words. But I'll, I'll just say exponent form. It's probably the easiest way of saying that. When you're given something like this right here, the x represents the base. And whatever is up here in this upper right corner is called the power or the exponent. Let's look at some more terminology. If you have something O oh, x raised to the first power, that's how you would say that, but you don't need the one, so it's just x. So as I said, the first power, you can just say it's x. Now the second one is x to the second power, but we don't have to say that. That's, that's kind of cumbersome, x to the second power. So you say x squared. Well, why is that? Well, let's say you have something like 10 squared. Now here's a, a way to visually see what we mean by 10 squared. It's 10 times 10 is 100. See, we have 10 blocks this way and, and you know 10 rows of 10 blocks. We have a total of 100. And see, and this forms a perfect square. So that's what we call this a squared term. You might think, well, what about the three? Can we do something special with that? The answer is yes. This is x to the third power, but you can also call this x cubed. And again, to visually see that, here's an example. Now, our very first example I talked about when we did exponents was six times six times six is 216. Here's a way of seeing that. I have six blocks in this direction. Okay, and then see there, think of it as six this way, or six inches 
times 6 inches and the height here is 6. There's 216 blocks in here and it forms a perfect cube. So that's where that comes from. And you might think, well, what about the fourth power? Is there some razzle-dazzle special names? Well, no. X to the fourth, X to the fifth, sixth, seventh, and so now on. If you're given a variable as the exponent, you can just say this is X to the Y power, or just X to the Y. If you want to put an exponent in the calculator, just use the power key, which is right here. Now, if you just want to square something, there's a special square key right here. Now, there's an option for inputting a cube, but most students don't use it, so we're not going to worry about it. Now, another thing I want to mention to you is when I verbally describe something being raised to an exponent or a power, I will use the word power. Something like this, if you want to input this in a calculator, we'll just type in 3 power, press the exponent key, or the power key, same name, and then type in 4, and press enter, and you get 81 as an answer. With this in mind, let's actually do some quick calculator drills. Okay, what is 15 squared? Press the clear key, type in 15, now press the square key, and enter. Of course, you could also use the power key, so you can clear. Type in 15, power to enter. Of course, if it's just being squared, it just means 15 is times itself twice. So you can just type in 15 times 15, but that's more keystroke, so we won't do that. Here's another example. What is negative 3 raised to the fourth power? Now I need to warn you on this. The negative with the 3 altogether is being raised to power. So you have to enclose the negative 3 in its own set of parentheses. Otherwise, you will get the wrong answer. So you want to have something that looks like this, not this. So let's try this. Clear, parentheses, negative 3, close parentheses, power 4. Again, the wrong way of doing this is had you typed in clear, negative 3 power 4. See, you got negative 81 as an answer. And see, that's actually the opposite of 3 to the 4th. So I want to stress that if you have a negative number, for example, like negative 5, and I want to raise it to some, some exponent, on a calculator, you can't just type in negative 5 power and the exponent. You may not necessarily get the correct answer. So to ensure that you do get the correct answer, always use parentheses when dealing with negative numbers being raised to powers. Division is the inverse or reverse operation of multiplication. It tells us how many times one number is contained within another number. The number being divided is called the dividend. The number doing the dividing is called the divisor. The result of a division is called the quotient. Let's talk about notation for division. You have something like, oh, say, x, and I would like to divide x by y. What kind of symbols and notations can I use? Well, the most standard one is, of course, the division sign or symbol. And that works fine with numbers or variables. What else can we do? Well, instead of this symbol, you can use a fraction bar. Now, the fraction bar can appear like this. So the items you're dividing are in a straight line. Another way of writing this out is one is slightly above the other like that. So this is still x divided by y. Personally, I don't like these two notations too much. 
when x and y are really actually more complicated expressions, it can be a little ambiguous. Mm -hmm. So the best way I recommend to write a division in algebra or using variables, or even numbers for that matter, is place a horizontal fraction bar. Now again, the slant is okay like if you want to compact something really nicely, like the, maybe the fraction is actually in a power, an exponent. Hey, that's a possibility. But overall, make it a habit of writing horizontal bars to represent division. Now, there is another way of representing the division, and that's something from, from of course, grade school. If you have something x divided by y can be represented like, like that. But see, this is, again, kind of cumbersome when you're doing with variables. Now, actually, there's a situation where we will be doing this in another lesson. And that's, of course, also called long division. But for just straightforward things, not a good notation. And some textbooks kind of curls this thing. And it's the same thing. It's just instead of nice straight lines, it kind of bends it. I don't like that too much. So... But with all these different notations, again, I prefer the horizontal fraction bar. Let's take a close look at those components of a division. So if we have 20 divided by 3, or this form, 20 divided by 3, this is how we, another way we can represent it with all the parts included. The 20 is the dividend, the 3 is the divisor, the 6 up here is the quotient. It's the result of the operation of division. And down here is the remainder, because 3 doesn't go into 20 perfectly. Now the first two rules of division are exactly the same as multiplication. If you're dividing numbers that have like signs, the answer is positive. So positive divided by positive, positive. Negative divided by negative, it's positive also. If the signs are different, one's positive, one's negative, then the result is going to be a negative number. Now our next two rules are a little more interesting. Rule number three is if you have zero divided by a number that's not zero, the result actually is zero. Now what happens if you actually switch these around? If I put the x here and the 0 there, what is any number that's not 0 divided by 0 going to be? Well, in this case, we don't have an answer. You say it's undefined. Now what I just said bears repeating. If you have a number, it's not 0, and you divide it by zero, so zero is in the denominator, we don't have a result. You say the answer is undefined. There is no definition that allows us to divide by zero. It, it produces contradictions if you try to combine it with other rules of mathematics. So if you have a zero down here, zero is your divisor, just say undefined. But again, I want to stress that zero on top is okay, and the answer is zero. If we're given some value x, and I want to find what's called the reciprocal, well first off, I need to rewrite this as a fraction. x is really x divided by 1. Okay? The reciprocal means just make your numerator the denominator and your denominator the numerator. In other words, you can just switch these two around. So 1 divided by x is the reciprocal of x. So here's another illustration of what I just talked about. What do you think the reciprocal of a divided by b is going to be? Well, very easy. Just switch these two around, and you're going to get b divided by a. They just flip. That's all what reciprocals are about. Why is it important to learn about reciprocals? Well, there's a really neat thing that happens when you multiply a number times its reciprocal. And here's a way to illustrate that. If you have 5 times its reciprocal, 1 over 5, or 1 fifth, the answer is actually 1. It's always 1. Here's another case. 
negative 3 sevenths times its reciprocal, flip it, negative 7 thirds, the answer is also 1. Now there is one number that doesn't have a reciprocal. Do you know which one it is? 0. And why is that? Well, let's rewrite this as 0 divided by 1 first. So that's still 0. I want to take its reciprocal. So we kind of switch things around a bit, and I get 1 divided by 0. You might think, well, well that's a reciprocal. Ah, but we just talked about the fact that you're not allowed to divide by 0. So 0 is unique that it does not have a reciprocal. One final thing I want to mention about reciprocals is that with them, any division now can be rewritten as a multiplication. So something like a divided by b really becomes a. Now, with variables, I don't want to use the time sign, so I'll just put a dot right there, raise dot, and that's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal of b, which is 1 over b. They're the same thing. a divided by b is a times 1 over b. Why do we want to know this? Well, it turns out because we can now state every division as really a multiplication, that means any rule of multiplication is automatically a rule for division. So it's kind of neat. Also, it may be difficult to divide some very long, complicated expressions, but we can again multiply by 1 divided by the reciprocal. It might be easier to do. So that is another advantage of doing the rewrite. The division key, seen here, is used to perform divisions. It is displayed in the calculator screen as a forward slant, like this. Now the reciprocal of a number can also be found using the reciprocal key, which is right here. But just to let you know, this is rarely used in practice. So if you want to find the reciprocal of something, just go one divided by the number. I like to evaluate this problem using the calculator. How do I go about doing that? Well, what we need to do is slap some parentheses on this thing. Okay, okay. what I mean by that is I need to just put parentheses around the numerator and then around the entire denominator. I don't mean, you know, get yourself a set of parentheses and just go smack them around a bit, okay? No, I don't condone violence towards mathematical symbols, okay? No, don't, don't go there, okay, please, all right. All right, so let's actually take a look at this in detail using the calculator. So let's try the problem I just put on the board in the calculator. So put the parentheses around it and type in the following. Clear? Parentheses, 4 plus 2, close parentheses, divided by, and I open parentheses, 5 minus 4, close parentheses, and then enter. The answer is 6. Well, all right, let's try another problem. To put this one in the calculator, do the following. Clear, negative 3, divided by, now the entire denominator should be placed in another set of parentheses. So parentheses, 2, and then parentheses again, 4 plus 8, close parentheses, and then close again, another set of parentheses, and finally enter. The answer is negative 0.125. So let's say we have some kind of division here, values, and I want to throw in some negatives. So let's say, oh, how about that? If I have a negative x, what is that equal to? Well, I can actually move this negative down there with the y. It's the same thing. Or, hey, I'll put it in the middle like this. So this is negative of the entire division. And Let's go one step further. Let's actually just go nuts and put negatives everywhere. Let's put a little more over here. So all what I just did 
are exactly the same thing. Another thing we can do, now this is a separate problem. If you have a fraction of turn of items and they're both have negatives on them, what does that tell us? Well, remember one of the rules of dividing is that if it's a negative divided by negative, what's the answer? Positive. So you really don't need the negatives at all. So if you see something with two negatives in it, it's positive. Now, one thing I want to stress is going back to the, the single negatives for a final answer on a test. Let's say you have some kind of fraction as a result and you want to write down the final answer. Where do we put the negatives? Should it be on top? Should it be on the bottom? Should it be in the middle? What's the deal? Well, they're all correct, as I said earlier, but additionally, you should avoid negatives in the denominator for a final answer. I mean, while you're working through a problem, there's different processes you're going through, if there's a negative downstairs, that's fine. But when all is said and done, you know, box or circle your answers, hey, this is my final answer, you don't want this down here. My recommendation, move it to the very outside of the whole entire fraction. It's a very clear, that means I want the negative of the entire thing. And that's the best way to go. Now let's say you have some value divided by itself. What is that really equal to? Well, the rule is anything divided by itself, make sure it's not zero, because I can't divide by zero, the result's one. And one final equation I want to talk about is x divided by one, which we talked about earlier, but let's formalize this. The rule is if you have a value divided by one, what is it equal to? Itself. 